Congratulations to Bill also for acquiring the Zimmerman home in Hilly. And his desire to share so much that he's gathered about this person that we are all fascinated by and his music has changed our lives. I also want to thank uh, Carpalus Manuscript uh, Library Museum and uh, the folks here who have always welcomed us and uh, especially because this year Bill's exhibit, which is on display here, it was um, supposed to be taken down July 1st, but when we found out Louis was coming, they very graciously have left me. And if you haven't seen some of the things up there, one of the, my favorites is some of the original lyrics to Bob's songs, but there's all kinds of really cool stuff up there, so make sure you take time. Um, Gino sang, just like Tom Thumb's blues here just a few minutes ago, the original handwritten lyrics are in this case right up here, so you want to see Bob's little tiny scrawl, you know, it's fun for us. Um, we are thankful that Mr. Carpa, when he came to Duluth, uh, he graduated from Denville, that he was told some people what he was doing. He'd been here, I don't know what, what reunion it was, but uh, when he mentioned what he was doing, somebody said, well, why don't you do that here? So that's why Carpolis is here. Uh, he was in touch with his people he graduated with. I want to give a special thanks to Gene LaFond and Amy Grillo and uh, their guitar accompanyers, David Bennett. Gene performed with uh, Larry Keegan for years uh, in the Twin Cities. He was on hand uh, for the opening of the Rolling Thunder Review in the first part, starting in New England. He also um, um, is a songwriter himself, inspired by Bob as a songwriter. He saw uh, Bob play. When he was 17, he used to go see uh, Bobby Zimmerman at the 10 o'clock Scholar in Dickentown. And, uh, but uh, we all find inspiration somewhere, and Bob found inspiration from somebody else in the armory here in Duluth, Buddy Holly. And uh, Buddy Holly's claims to fame are many, but he was a prolific songwriter, and uh, his life was cut short, but he is, um, the torch was passed on and has been carried on. We also, this is a, a John Bushy Memorial Encore Lecture, celebrating the legacy of John Bushy, and it's something that John would have loved to have been part of here tonight. I know many times he told me that, uh, as we all, anybody who knows John, he kept himself going by having things to look forward to, and one of the things he was really looking forward to was Louis Kemp's book. And many times he said, Louis's writing a book. Louis's writing a book. And so um, we're truly grateful to have Louis here uh, as part of the John Bushy Memorial Lecture Series, which is we've been conducting now the last couple of years in conjunction with the Duluth Dillon Fest. We're pleased to have John's brother and sister, Jim and Barbara, here, and we appreciate their support for everything we're doing, and we appreciate them. Because John was a magician, as many of us know all too well, I was going to open with some magic tricks. I'm not a professional magician, not since I was a kid, but I did have some tricks up my sleeve, but what I decided to do instead was to make my little magic show disappear. And if, how good you are at Bob Dylan trivia, uh, there's a line where it's done with a flick of the wrist. You know what song that's from? Make the queen disappear. You got it. The sweetheart right there. I write Bob Dylan trivia on my blog and also during trivia during the trivia night. Without uh, let's see if we got a speaker coming. We want to thank Zane Bale, who's kind of the heartbeat of our Dylan Fest. Louis, I have to, I could probably
probably get away with not saying who he is because we all know him, but I'm going to just say a few things. Uh, he's the th third generation of Kemp Fisheries. He took it from being a Lake Superior fishing to also Alaska fishing. He's a businessman and uh, met Bob Dylan uh, when he was Bobby Zimmerman. In fact, if you read the book, you'll notice that he doesn't call Bob Dylan, except for on the cover. He calls him, uh, and he calls him Bobby throughout the book. And uh, because they were buddies as boys, he and Larry and, and Bobby at uh, Herzl Camp in Wisconsin. Um, he's got a lot of stories, uh, new stories that aren't in any of the other uh, biographies, and I'm going to just give it to Louis. Thank you, Louis. So first I want to draw attention to my t-shirt. <laughs> my good friend, childhood friend from Duluth, Mike Goldfine, found this online and sent it to me. As a side note, I ordered one for Bobby, and when I get back, I'll send that to him. Because it began here for both of us, as well for all of you, probably, most of you. So they tell me I'm an author, so that's kind of a strange handle. I'm not used to being called an author. I've been called a lot worse than that, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so it was a fun process writing this book. And uh, as I searched the, the vacuums of my memory, it brought me back, uh, you know, to a lot of stories I had obviously thought about for a long time. And a, a lot of people who were in my life at different times have made a lot of things possible that I was able to experience and accomplish. And so there's a lot of gratitude that you know, developed through that process. So the book opens with this paragraph. It was at summer camp in northern Wisconsin in 1953 that I first met Bobby Zimmerman from Hibby. He was 12 years old and he had a guitar. He would go around telling everybody that he was going to be a rock and roll star. I was 11 and I believed him. But the truth is, he went far beyond that. <laughs> he blew that away. We passed that a long time ago. He's got, you know, his influence has gone way beyond being a rock and roll star. And you know, the awards and accolations, including the Nobel Prize in literature. For a kid born in St. Mary's Hospital in Duluth, that's pretty good. <laughs> so the end of that chapter, the Herzl Camp chapter, ends like this. Another performance I remember fondly took place on a warm afternoon a few summers later in 1957. This was the traditional day when the campers took on the roles of the counselors. The idea was to teach us responsibility, leadership, and cooperation. All qualities that my two friends and I generally lacked at that time. Bobby took the place of Shlomo, the music director. Though he'd often beaten the poor old piano to death with impromptu performances inside the activities room, Bobby had never played his guitar on, on top of the building. Now, seven years before Fiddler on the Roof would open on Broadway, he proceeded to do just that. All day long, silhouetted against the sun, Bobby played every rock and roll and blues song anybody had ever heard of, and lots that we hadn't. Larry and I kept him supplied with water and requests. As all day long, kids 
would stop by to listen in the courtyard below. Seeing Bobby and the roof in full performance mode like a maestro at Carnegie Hall convinced me that nothing could, would, or should ever stop him. He was our fiddler on the roof, and this would become the indelible image of the last days of our childhood. Bobby didn't look anything like the vapidly handsome blonde pop stars of the day. He looked like a skinny little Jewish kid who would never be anybody's bet to conquer the world, but that's exactly what he did. We're talking about Carnegie Hall. Bobby actually played there um, right early on in his career, which was, I remember meeting Beattie on Superior Street one day, his mother, and she was all excited. And she said, my Bobby's gonna play Carnegie Hall, Ava and I are going out for it. Wow. <laughs> so there's a famous occasion that happened here in Duluth that is known all over the world now. At the time Buddy Holly played at the Duluth Armory, the three days before he passed away. So Bobby and I went to that concert together. And this is an excerpt from the book about, about that. The most important show to Bobby that year, though, was not one of his own performances, it was a show he seemed to know he would never get to see again. The date was January 31st, 1959. It was a Saturday night, and with the wind chill, the temperature at Duluth was minus 44 degrees. Of course, us who grew up here, you know, experienced that a lot. That in some small part is why I live in Los Angeles. <laughs> The car we drove was my dad's 58 metallic blue Buick. Bobby was 17, I was 16. And we were on our way to see what would be one of Buddy Holly's last concerts. He was 22, and, was just three, and it was just three days before he, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper would perish in a plane crash while taking off in an Iowa blizzard. Another great, Waylon Jennings, would have been on that list had he not given up his seat to the Big Bopper. Waylon was unknown at that time. Later, he gained great fame on his own. And the, the Crickets, who were buddies back of that, didn't come for, for this tour. The Texas boys, I think they checked the temperature a very good And so he put together a backup band of which uh, Waylon was part of. It. To this day, whenever Buddy Holly's classic, Oh Boy, comes on the radio, I feel the hairs at the back of my neck snap to attention. The words seem to be emanating from his soul straight to my heart. This was my favorite song all through high school, Duluth Central High School. And Tom Miller is here who went to Duluth Central High School. Bobby's musical interest was much wider and deeper than mine. Even as a child, he faithfully listened to the late night radio stations from the South, something that Buddy Holly had been doing in Lubbock, Texas, just a few years before. When I think about it, there never seems to be a time when Bobby had not been a big fan of Buddy's. There's no doubt that the rock and roll pioneer was a seminal influence his musical life. There were many similarities between Buddy and Bobby, but one that Bobby probably wasn't aware of was that they each had a high school girlfriend named Echo, which is a very unusual name, and both their high school girlfriends were Echo. One in Hibby and one in Lubbock, Texas. It's widely known that one of Bob's classic songs, Girl from the North Country, was about his girlfriend, Echo Hellstrom. We arrived at the Duluth National Guard Army for something called the Winter Dance Party, 
and found the tickets to be pretty pricey, ranging from a buck twenty-five. That was if you bought them ahead of time, which we did, all the way up to two dollars. Well, that was real money in 1959. You could go to Granada or North Shore for 20, 25 cents. So, you know, that was, that was real money. We pooled our resources and shoved our way in, working our way through the dancing party throng of 2,000 excited, withering young people. But Bobby and Louie, we sneaked our way right up to the edge of the stage, mere feet away from Buddy as he performed. As still as a statue, Bobby stood there mesmerized, never taking his eyes off of Buddy. Perhaps time has embellished my memory of that night, but Buddy seemed to be smiling down on Bobby with an almost celestial countenance. At one point, he nodded to Bobby, seemingly as if he knew his own remaining time was brief, and that Bobby would one day take up his mantle as one of the greatest musical artists of the world. Only four years later, Bobby would write Blowing in the Wind, just four years later, and start fulfilling that prophecy. I've always believed that a spiritual connection of some kind was forged that night between Buddy Holly and Bobby Zimmerman. Though no one in the crowd was aware of it, I only know what I saw, and it looked a lot like a torch being passed. That was a very special night. Uh, before I came here today, I was invited to come out to the armory, which I did, and mark the spot, approximately the spot, where we stood during that historic concert. And they're going to put a, a star on, on the floor there. And, uh, and I did a few interviews there on the stage as well. It, it, it was a you know, very special experience for me to be back there. So the next story from the book that I'm going to share with you. I went to UMD for two years. Then, I transferred on to the main U. Bobby had gone straight to the main U, lived in a uh, fraternity house for a while, then uh, moved over to uh, Dinky Town, above Gray's drugstore, played in the 10 o'clock scholar, and that's where he really got exposed uh, you know, to folk music and, and a lot of new things. He met some very sophisticated and talented musicians on there that, that he learned from and that helped advance his, his skills and interests. Then he hitchhiked with five hours in his sock, his guitar over his shoulder, and a grip during a blizzard um, heading for New York. So a car pulls over and says, yeah. Where are you going? So I'm going to New York City. He said, well, I'm going to Madison. You, you, you can come that far. So he was thrilled to get into the warm because he, he, he as he said it to me, he, he was building up so much snow, he looked like a snowman. So he was happy to get in. He got in. The guy took him as far as Madison. He stayed there for a while and eventually got a ride uh, to New York City. But we all know what eventually happened then. So when I moved on to the main U, I, I moved into a fraternity called Phi Epsilon Pi, Phi Epsilon, right, which was at the time right across from the, the U of M football stadium on the University of Alabama. And this is a story that happened while I was there. From the time I was around 13, I was a championship arm wrestler, able to beat everyone my age, even the football players and weightlifters. Like as well as many of my teachers and counselors did. One day, I was in the process of arm wrestling the whole fraternity, one after another, usually slamming their arms down in seconds. One of my frat brothers, a great guy named Paul Goldstein, who unfortunately has passed away, saw that I was going through the guys and decided 
he wanted to show me up. He went and found his friend, Carl Ellen. <laughs> The All-American Defense Event for the Golden Gophers, who later became an All-Pro star for the Vikings and an NFL Hall of Famer. Because of his size and strength, everybody called Carl Moose. That was his nickname. Rightfully so. That was huge. Paul invited Moose to come over and destroy me. I guess the guy figured it would be a fun piece of cake. He later told me he beat everybody on the Gophers at our mess. So he figured, no, this little Jewish kid should be a piece of cake. When I looked up to see how many more victims lay ahead of me, I was astonished to see Moose in the line of all seven guys back. He had his arms crossed over his chest and stared grimly in my direction, which made me break out of a big smile. And also I sweat until it was a little bit intimidating. Let's see how good you are now, big shot. Paul cackled. Moose waited his turn, and when he got to the front of the line and sat down across from me, I had to admit he was pretty intimidating. His hand looked more like a club. And when he locked it with mine, my elbow dangled six inches off the table. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the same thing like this would look like. I had never seen an arm as big as his. Gamely, I called for someone to bring over some phone books and put them under my elbow to get some footing and leverage. Then we got to it, each of us trying hard to conquer the other. My frat brothers were all screaming and yelling, some for me and some chanting, Moose, Moose, Moose. He was a big shot on campus and everybody knew Carl Howard and everybody loved him. Bets were thrown and anyone betting on me got big odds. It was brother against brother, just like in Civil War times. And the profanities were flying. Our arms wavered back and forth, a couple of inches each way, as the veins in our necks popped and our faces turned beet red. We huffed and puffed, groaned and moaned. And after about five minutes, which is a long time in our wrestling, it seemed obvious that neither of us was going to fold. We mutually decided to call the drop to the amazement of the crowd. After that epic showdown, whenever I saw Carl on campus, he came over and shook my hand and said, You are one tough Jew boy, he said, which is a big compliment coming from the moose. <laughs> so I gotta tell you, to this day, that's one of the highlights of my life, you know? <laughs> Screw the fish business and all that other crap. This is a big deal. <laughs> I told my kids to put it on my tombstone. I don't think <laughs> So the next story that I'll share with you is an uh, excerpt from, from a chapter. This happened in, in the Twin Cities. And it goes like this. Coming off of Tour 74, Bobby's creative juices were flowing big time. When I came back from Alaska in July, I went to see Bobby at his place outside Minneapolis, and he played me the songs he had written. These would constitute his critically acclaimed album, Blood on the Tracks, and I was one of the first people to hear them. He actually sat in a chair right in front of me with his acoustic and sang it in Hoel. Then he said, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young are playing tonight in St. Paul. Do you want to come? Do you want to go with me? I was thinking, is the bear shit in the woods? Of course I want to go with you. 
we went to the concert which was at the St. Paul Civic Center. Afterwards, we went to the hotel where the band was staying. Bill Graham and Barry M. offered the tour promoters, so we had a chance to see and visit with them again. After a while, Bobby mentioned to Stephen Stills. They had just written some new songs, and of course, Stephen wanted to hear them. So Bobby, Stephen, and I went into the bedroom of the suite, and Bobby played a few songs. Stephen was obviously loaded. And when Bobby sang Idiot Wind, he became paranoid and very agitated. You wrote that song about me, he shouted. Why did you write that song about me? He jumped up and got right in Bobby's face. As Bobby's friend and self-appointed protector, I jumped in between them so Stephen could not get any closer. Carefully, I eat Stephen back. Bobby just laughed and said, Relax, man, the song's not about you. As he continued to sing and strum without missing a beat. Millions of people around the world identified personally with Bobby's songs and feel as if he is speaking directly to them. But few of them are loaded enough to think the songs were actually written about them. So there was a favorite, famous concert that was memorialized by Martin Scorsese as a, as a documentary called The Last Waltz. And I'm sure some of you have seen it. If you haven't, you should check it out on Netflix. It was an amazing concert. So I have a chapter in the book titled The Last Waltz. I'm going to share that with you. Bill Graham was a big fan of the smoked lake superior trout I had introduced him to while we were on tour 74. From time to time he would ask me if he could buy some from me, but of course I said there's no way I'd sell it to, to you. He didn't feel right about taking it for free, so he said let's make a deal. How about you send me the smoke trout and I give you concert tickets whenever you want? Deal. Bill <laughs> Graham was the foremost music promoter in the country. He handled all the good tours and he got me the best tickets. When the Rolling Stones played Minneapolis, he gave me the best seats in the house. I took my friends, they were blown away. We sat in the second row of the dead center. It was great. And when he was planning the band's final concert to be called The Last of Walls, he contacted me. It went without saying that I'd be at the show, but that wasn't what the call was about. He told me the band was planning a Thanksgiving feast at the venue prior to the concert. Would I provide some salmon for him? <laughs> sure, I said. Consider it a gift for me and Bobby. True to my word, I provided 300 pounds the last King Salmon from Bethel. By the way, there's some Bethel people here who used to work for me up there. And that salmon came from, from our, our Bethel fishery. True to my word, I provided 300 pounds of Alaskan King Salmon for the last 12 feast. Compliments of the boys from the North Country. The day before the concert, Bobby and I flew up to San Francisco. We had booked rooms at the Macau Hotel, where a lot of the concert people were staying. We agreed to meet up in the lobby and go over to Winterland together for the show. At the point in time, I went down to meet Bobby, but he wasn't there yet. So I looked around for a place to wait. I spotted an empty chair next to a distinguished looking black man. We greeted each other, and after a little while, Bobby came down. He saw me and started in my direction. When he was about 10 feet away, he started laughing. I went over to him, and as we walked towards the door, Bobby was still chuckling. Then he said, 
is one of the funniest sights I've ever seen. What? I asked innocently. Muddy waters of Louis Camp City together. <laughs> that was muddy waters? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> what the ride was quite a scene. Bill had decorated the hall spectacularly. Barroom sets from La Traviata. There were tables with mounds of delicious looking food, including the salmon we'd provided. The show had sold out in one day, and the place was brimming with 5,400 fans. Today, thanks in no small, no small part to Martin Scorsese's epic film of the event, everybody knows who played at that concert. Among others, aside from the band, there was Neil Young, Neil Diamond, Joni Mitchell, Van Morrison, Muddy Waters, a new friend. Paul Butterfield, Eric Clapton, Ringo Starr, Bobby Charles, Ronnie Hawkins, Dr. John, Stephen Stills, my nemesis, Ron Wood, and last but definitely not least, Bobby, the musician's musician. It seemed that all of the artists wanted to talk to Bobby, and he was friendly and gracious to everyone. Governor Jerry Brown was backstage and took the opportunity to fawn over him. Bobby just remained Bobby. He laid back, he was laid back, taking it all in. In order to get his film bankroll, Scorsese had had to pr pr promise a headliner. When he dropped Bob's name, Warner Brothers had quickly forked over the cash on the understanding that Bobby would be a highlight of the film. At the time, Bobby was editing the movie we'd shot during the Rolling Thunder review, the novel and third. Bobby's appearance in the Scorsese film concerned Howard Hulk was working with Bobby on the editing and development of that project. With Bobby's appearance in the last volume detract from the impact of their own movie. Bobby thought about this, and just before the concert began, he gave Bill Graham an ultimatum. I don't want all of my songs to be filmed, he said. Just two of them. I'm going to put Louie <laughs> on the stage next to you and Marty, and he will tell you when you can film me. <laughs> Bill freaked out. Our, fin our financing depends on your appearance in this film, he insisted. But Bobby would not relent. He was planning to perform four songs and they could film only the last two. There I stood, the enforcer, next to Marty Scorsese, Bill Graham, and Jonathan Tapley, the producer. The cameraman took their marching orders from Scorsese, of course, but I was tasked with getting them to turn their cameras away from Bobby and come down from their towers during his early numbers. After that, they could scamper back up and shoot as they pleased. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> the lights went down, and Bobby came out to a thundering ovation. He danced around the stage as he performed a lively, rousing rendition of Baby Let Me Follow You Down. The crowd went wild. Then he moved right into Hazel from Planet Ladies. Near the end of it, I told Bill and Marty to get ready and signal the cameraman they get back on their perches and swing their cameras around. The cameras rolled as Bobby launched into his third song. I don't believe you. She acts like we never have met. And kept going through to his fourth, for every young. That one really brought the house down. That was supposed to be the end of the set, but Bobby calls his own shots and decides to swing back into Baby, let me follow you down. Much to the surprise of everybody, including the band. When I realized what was happening, I told Marty and Bill to turn off the cameras. Marty pretended he didn't hear me, and Bill went completely bonkers. Screw you, he shouted. Actually, he said a lot worse than that, but the purpose of the book, that's why I did it. Roll the damn cameras, roll them. 
Right there, as Bobby was performing, Bill and I got into a yelling and shoving match. We were actually had our hands on each other and shows that were pushing each other back and forth, screaming at each other. <laughs> Even trying to bribe him which the period job didn't work at that point. <laughs> back off, Bill screamed. This is history, man. Don't mess with it. This is my show. I understood where Bill was coming from. I knew him to be a volatile guy, accustomed to controlling everything in the Jewish nation. He resented Bobby and me telling him what he could or could not do at his own show. But I had a job to do, and I was trying like hell to do it. That work caused Bobby to glance over at me like, what the hell's going on over there? Then he went back to hypnotize the audience with his artistry as I continued trying to fend off Bill and shut down the camera crew. By the time Bobby gave the crowd yet another gift by performing I Shall Be Released, along with the band and a bunch of other artists, I'd given up trying to stop the inevitable. After the show, I explained to Bobby what had happened. In his usual fashion, he said, it's okay, Louie, you did a good job. So these are all excerpts from different chapters. That was a full chapter, but the rest of them are all excerpts from different chapters. I'm going to end with reading to you with one last excerpt and then we can do some curing. It was Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement. At the tail end of the 1980s, Bobby was attending service at the Chabad House in Santa Monica, presiding with the venerable rabbi, Avram Levitansky, beloved and revered by his congregation. We had been there before, and the rabbi recognized Bobby right away. But few of his fellow worshippers, all somberly dressed, realized he was standing at the back of the room. Having as usual missed the memo regarding the dress code, Bobby was wearing cowboy boots, torn jeans, a hoodie, a black leather jacket, and what looked like a long lost pair of Jackie Kennedy sunglasses. <laughs> Specifically, he was attending the Nila service. In Hebrew, Nila means closing the gate. As the day of Yom Kippur comes to a close and our future is being sealed, we turn to God to offer our repentance and new resolutions and ask that he seals us in the Book of Life. We ask him to grant us a new year replete with goodness and happiness. The Nila ends with the blowing of the shofar and the prayer that includes, next year may we be in Jerusalem. The ark housing the holy scrolls of the Torah remains open for the entire service and is considered a great honor to be chosen by the rabbi to open them. This carries with it many blessings for the new year. The honor customary goes to the temple's most generous donor. But not this time. With his ancient eyes, Rabbi Levitansky scoured the congregation. At last, his gaze came to rest upon a solitary figure standing in the back of the room. He motioned the casually dressed fellow up to the pulpit, and up he came. Bob Dylan opened the ark on Yom Kippur. Afterwards, when the last echo of the chauffeur had diminished to silence, and most of the congregants had trickled away, the biggest donor to the temple sought out Rabbi Levitansky 
and pulled him aside. I want you to know, Rabbi, said the man, that when you didn't call me up to open the ark, I was quite hurt. Then I saw who you chose, and I realized you were even wiser and kinder than I had imagined. So I'm going to double my contribution for the coming year. It takes a great and generous heart to give the honor of opening the ark for Neela to a homeless Jew. <laughs> The rabbi has long since passed away, taking his spiritual secrets with him. As for the donor, unless he reads it here, he still doesn't know that the homeless Jew was Bob Dylan. <laughs>
good friend of some of us here, one of the guys that worked for me in management in Alaska, Gary B. from Superior, I told him to bring his, his acoustic guitar with him, and he did. He, brought, he was a guest, and he brought it with him. And uh, there's another musician there, Kinky Freeman, real character, and uh, he, he took the guitar and he sang. And then there was our other friend who I speak about, quite a bit in the book, Larry Keegan, who we had met originally at the Herzl camp and stayed friends with him until he passed away in 2001. He was a musician, he was a quadriplegic, but he was a musician, the old songs he sang. He sang. And at some point, I wouldn't have asked Bobby to sing at my wedding, you know? But I didn't stop him either. <laughs> and he took the guitar and he sang. So that house in Duluth, that you're familiar with, 3700 Road, uh, is uh, one of the few places where we ever sang to big crowds in a private house. What's Bob thinking of Mark? What did you think of all that? What is he thinking of Mark? Oh, was it? So I sent it to him a couple weeks ago. You know, I haven't heard from him, which isn't unusual. Uh, but, uh, I would think that he would find a lot of these stories very refreshing and amusing and, and bring back great memories. Can you talk about Larry when he was on his feet? When he was on his what? When he was on his feet, like in that picture. Oh, yeah. Okay, I've got pictures here. Let me deal with that, too. So, okay. Oh, yeah. So this, this picture was taken at Herzl Camp when we all met. This is when we were at Herzl Camp. This picture was taken in 1957. Obviously that's Bobby in the middle holding his guitar. When he brought the camp and sang a lot for him. On the left is Larry Keegan, our other amigo, who we stayed friends with for his whole life. That's me on the right. In fact, this guy on, on my right and the guy in the middle both came uh, to uh, readings that, that I did at the bookstore in St. Paul two nights ago. It was really fun to see him. This is our Bobby at Herzl Camp. On the Sabbath, whites. It was a Jewish camp, and on the Sabbath, we declared the word white. This is the famous poster, it's a copy of the famous poster, that advertised uh, the winter dance party uh, at the Army in 1959. I don't know if there's any originals running around, but it was a good to find one before the guy who was it. But this was, the, the, there was a fellow named Lou Lava, who was a, a DJ at the time. He promoted this. He brought you know, the Lincoln Dance Party to the world. <laughs> so this, my father, so that's my sister there, and that's Dwight Eisenhower. And you can see right between them, there's a gentleman, that's my dad, Abe Kemp, who uh, was active in, in the Republican Party right way back then. And so he was uh, part of the greeting uh, committee that greeted Ike when he came to Duluth during that campaign in 1952. You see, we got those signs on us, I like Ike, that was his slogan. And we presented that Ike with a 25-pound fresh Lake Superior truck. And that picture was in the news to the <laughs> that, that brings back you know, good memories. The guy in the middle was Sam Owens. He was the sheriff of St. Louis County. This was a letter that Ike sent to my father after the banking. <laughs> so 
So this picture was taken at Wall's department store in downtown Duluth. <laughs> just before Christmas, we found out my mother just, you know, she took us out on an adventure. And then we saw all the other kids lined up, you know, take pictures with Santa Claus. And of course, we wanted the two. She said, well, we don't really know, but, yeah, but let's take a picture. So she did. And, uh, and <laughs> I just love this picture. So, and I had this picture up in my house in Los Angeles. And when my now 17 year old son was five, Ellie, he saw this picture and he said to me, Dad, who's the rabbit? <laughs> Shelter life that they didn't know that was, that's, that's, how it goes. that's a true story. And when I read them, that wish me to laugh. He said, Did I say that? I said, I, said, I got witnesses. <laughs> this is a picture of Robert B. hanging out in New York in 1972. And a cool picture. That's in the book. This picture was taken when, when Bobby was shooting the movie Back Care Billy the Kid in Durango, Texas. That's a very, very famous character actor, Harry Dean Stanton, Larry, me, Bobby, and one of Bobby's kids. That's the movie that he wrote uh, the song, he wrote the whole soundtrack for the, the, the song Knock at Heaven's Door came out of that soundtrack. <laughs> so I was on tour 74 with, uh, you know, just as a friend, just hanging around and did the whole tour. And, you know, they play a lot of pranks on tours. And the promoter was Bill Graham and Bill Emlin. By that time, we got to be pretty friendly. And they, they knew I was in my room. So they got a key from the manager. You know, they had about 40 rooms and they had some juice. You know? And they got a key. And they brought the tour photographer with them. And they came running in with all these chickens, there was two more. Uh, and threw them on the bed. I was probably talking to the fish company then, I was doing that thing. And so that picture came from that occasion. So this picture was taken during the Rolling Thunder, with Joan and Bob performing. And I'm in the middle, it seems like I was, it was a trio, but it wasn't. I was, I was standing really like 10, 12 feet back. And somehow the angle of the camera sucked me into the cinema and was going closer. So that's a great picture for all of you. This is a picture taken at a surprise birthday party. We'll talk about this in the book. It's Cher, that's Cher of the White, Bobby, and I were singing Happy Birthday to David Geffen. This was his 31st birthday. So that is my, my backstage pass that I wore for the whole tour. I don't know if you can see, there's something sticking out there. But, uh, that was my favorite. This is a sign, this is a sign that we had a trip because those, those concerts sold out really quickly. This is from Spirit Mountain. Bobby, Joan Baez, Roger McGuinn, and some of the other people from the Rolling Thunder when the tour ended. They said, they said, we don't want this tour to end, so I gotta go back to the movie of the fifth season. They said, well, we don't want to go home. They said, well, come to Duluth with me. We have a, a, a great uh, ski hill that was for a We can ski for three, four days. So they said, okay, we're coming. And we got on the phone and booked some cottages up there, bungalows, and this is a receipt from the Spirit Valley Ski Resort. It says Dylan and Byers on it, and it lists a lot of the ski stuff that you know, they got you know, to go to ski. This picture was taken in one of the bungalows, 1975, at Spirit Valley. That's me, Joan, Bobby, and my sister Sharon, and Dylan's son. So, Joan and I got to be good friends, and she gave me this 
kind of Joe picture of this. He dressed up. And Joe was a serious person, but she had a great sense of humor. So she she dressed up. She dressed up for this picture and gave it to me. You can't she inscribed it, you can't read. You read it because it doesn't show up when I write it in the it says. I can't remember the exact words it was, it was something like this. Louie, I told you I have a different lifestyle. But that's okay. I'm flexible. Do you want to buy me a Mercedes Benz? Which is from a jazz shop in San It's a famous one. Alright, so this was from a benefit concert that I brought Marlon and Randall to. That's Bill Graham and a lot of Marlon and myself. And there's a story about this in the book. The Godfather. This is when we're rolling thunder. That's Bobby, that's me right off the side. And that's old Jay Simpson. He came to one of the concerts. That's when we thought he was a good guy. That's Bobby and I on the other side there. This is the first time Bobby ever went to, uh, to play in Japan. The great men to come with in 1978. I used to sell most of my fish, salmon from Alaska to Japan, so I had customers there, so it was a good opportunity to do two things. And that's me off to the left. He was, he was mobbed by the paparazzi and the fans. It was this chaos at the airport. This is our Roy Thunder with Johnny Mitchell, who, who has stayed to be to this day a good friend of mine. This is Elton Ginsberg with me on the Roy Thunder, famous poet. This is Bobby and I after the last concert in Madison Square Garden, the night of the hurricane, which was a benefit for Ruben Hurricane Carter. This is at my wedding in the room at my house. In the room. This is Bobby with the rabbi, Rabbi Friedman, who was there. And a few people have seen a picture like that with Bobby with such a big smile wearing a tuxedo. And happened here in Duluth. That's Bobby and I. He was my best man. That's Bobby walking down the aisle at my house and for the ceremony. That's right after we had broken the glass and officially became married. That's, you can't see it so in this picture, but that's probably walking towards us to uh, congratulate us. This is, <laughs> <laughs> some of you might be familiar with it. This packaging is a representative. One of the packages from the Lewis and the Seafood Company, the crowd that's uh, manufactured here in Duluth, in West Duluth. This is a ship, 350 ship, foot uh, seafood processing ship that, that I had. And the Barry Trader, some of the guys who work here in Alaska are familiar with that. Steaming out of Seattle Harbor, the Lake Alaska. 200 people with them to the, the, the process and to maintain the ship. This picture was taken at Bob's 50th birthday party. Outside of Minneapolis, I was poison. That's where we were with Bob. This is the house that I had in the roof, uh, 3700 Wonder Road. It used to be Robert Cardinick's house. Greg Fox really went on to do great things uh, at UMD. Uh, actually worked for Dorothy Condon during those days. He remembers her well. This is, this picture is in the book. It's uh, from my collection of Long Thunder Never Be Here. You get to see that in the movie. This is uh, with Joni last year, last November, at her 75th birthday party, Tony Mitchell. And this is my favorite, my eight-year-old granddaughter, Frida, who's named after my mother, Frida Campbell's. Some people in this audience might know from the old days who was a wonderful lady and a character and a great mother. Uh, Frida gave me this picture and I cherished it. 
John Bushy, the way I met John, is one who was living in the house on Wonder Road, and my daughter wanted, it was either her first or second birthday party, I wanted to, you know, have it to be something very special. So I asked around, you know, what type of entertainment I could get, and I asked for a magician, somebody, I can't recall who, gave me John's name and number, and I called him. And he came down and put on a great show, and I heard her friends just loved him. And as I gave John a tour of the house afterwards, I had no idea what he was about to do. You know, there was different memorabilia on the walls there, the rolling thunder, the painting of dogs, other stuff. And John obviously you know, enjoyed it. He didn't tell me, though, at that time, you know, his passion. But later on, over the years, as we got to know each other more, he showed it with me. John always was a special person, and we all miss him. I think it's John. Any other questions? Thanks, Bob. <laughs> were, were you around for Bob's little-known movie, Mask and Anonymous? And were you with him at the National Rainbow Gathering in Northern Michigan in 2002 that the movie is based on? Yes, no, I was No? <laughs> She's that guy. You know, after 55 years, there's only a couple of things I remember. Uh, number one is he used to knock me on my ass playing football in the park. It's football, man. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, is last time, um, he goes walking with a Bible in my hand, hitchhiking out to children's home in the West Coast, uh, Fort Canada. And then you picked me up, and I mentioned, uh, yeah, Bob is in the Bible, and you mentioned, yeah, he'll grow up out of it. <laughs> so I kind of wanted to see if he grew out of it. It was kind of a messianic pursuit. And um, uh, what else? Did Alan get Ginsburg get on you? Oh, I like Alan Ginsburg. You know, he, Alan Ginsburg was, as I referred to him in the book, as the moral compass on that tour. You know, if anybody got too carried away or out of line, you know, he would be the one that calm him down. And there'd be times I'd be bragging on a reporter for violating tour rules or something. And he'd tell me on the show, he said, well, tone it down, baby, tone it down. Yeah, he, he, was, he was a good man. And Bob did go up on the You'll see the book, the whole story is there. Listen, he comes back to him, but he doesn't. Yeah. Well, it's true. It's true. They should believe it, because it's true. He, he comes in, does you know, quietly. He comes to the little things.
Okay, thank you for coming.